here he says, Divination, spiritualism, necromancy, astrology, crystal gazing spells, witchcraft, sorcery, and numerology all fall within the magic category. These and other occult practices, as well as their related beliefs, invade fantasy, and when, when they are too accurately presented by the author. Well, let's see. Tolkien had divination with the runes. Spiritualism, he certainly had that. Necromancy, yep, that's there. Astrology, yeah, looking up in the skies and stuff like this. And he had runes, special runes that appeared with only on the, the cycle of a full moon. You know, crystal gazing. Well, he looks, you know, there's a scrying thing there, the pool of water that Galadriel has and Frodo looks into it. Spells, well, sure, that's there. You know, this this king, this, uh, I forget the king, it's been a while now since i watched these movies, but the one king, he's under a spell by Saruman. So there were spells, witchcraft, all through the thing, and sorcery, and numerology. It's all in Tolkien's book, and he's saying, that stuff is bad, but these other, you know, it's it's okay, some of the other stuff. Guy is very, very, very confused, or very cleverly deceiving. I believe it's probably the latter. Okay, here he says, again, the same book, page 57, chapter 3. Even mild violence may be an appropriate and necessary part of the story. Example given the various battles in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings series. Mild violence is good too. The occultism is good. Violence is good. All this stuff is wonderful for your, the development of your child. According to Richard Baines. Down here. Says here. Um, also in full swing was the hype and hysteria surrounding Dungeons and Dragons, a new role-playing game indirectly inspired by the Lord of the Rings. He had hype and hysteria that led to a guy killing his parents. The more children, indeed, the more people of all ages who read the Lord of the Rings, the better it will be not only for the literary level of this country, but for its spiritual health. <laughs> uh, okay, you know literary level and uh, also the spiritual health of, health of America, the more people read Lord of the Rings. Like Tolkien's elves, the Meyer and Valar are simply exercising their God-given, i.e. Eru-given, it's not God, it's Eru-given abilities when they practice magic, either for good or evil. It's God-given abilities when you practice magic for good or evil. Don't you understand that? That's in the King James Bible. Some, the book of Acts, they were practicing magic for good and evil. <sighs> Continuing, page 174, chapter 7. Tolkien's magic bears little outward resemblance to an actual occult practices in our world. Liar. Okay, here he says, Tolkien's magic takes place in an alternate reality, another realm entirely separate from our world. Not what Tolkien said. He said, I'm writing a history. Okay. Tolkien's magic is based on imaginary concepts of magic, only loosely connected to real world mythology and legend. Versus Rowling's magic, based primarily on real occult practices like spellcasting, herbology, uh, hello, <laughs> alchemy, astrology, crystal gazing, divination. Tolkien's magic. Good characters do not use the same magic that is used by evil characters. Yes, they do. But what, what, are you, what in the world are you talking about here, buddy? Richard Abanes, what in the world are you talking about? Herbology is real world occultism, huh? So taking herbs and using herbs medicinally, I'm not talking about smoking marijuana or something like that. I'm talking about herbal remedies and things like that. Herbology is occultism. So you should stay away from that. You should stay away from herbs and things, but it's okay, you know, to all the other occultism and practices and stuff in Lord of the Rings. Sure. Down here, violence and death are never are not intrinsically bad for children to read about if such episodes in fantasy are not gratuitous in nature, which Tolkien's is. There's people, you know, these orcs having their heads cut off and all kinds of vicious stuff. Question, how can one how can anyone say the Lord of the Rings is direct different from Harry Potter when they deal both deal with magic and wizards? Answer Rowling's fantasy includes magic, while Tolkien's tale employs imaginative, highly stylized fairy tale magic, i.e. enchantment. Oh, well, then it's totally Christian and wonderful. Enchantment, good. Magic, bad. <laughs> yeah, sure. Down here, 
He says, for example, Stephen King's book, Desperation, actually has a great deal of Christian teaching in it and is quite favorable towards Christianity. It also shows the beauty of one's personal relationship to God and the power of Christian prayer over evil. Huh? Okay. Down here he says, Second, many occult practices involve entered, entering into an altered state of consciousness, which he's talking about that being a good thing throughout the book there, wherein one's normal everyday awareness or consciousness is replaced by an alternate or altered awareness. An ASC is induced with anything when anything interrupts or brings to a halt the normal pattern, patterns of conceptual thought without extinguishing or diminishing consciousness itself. Interesting quote considering that he spoke positively on page 20 about entering into alternate realities when reading fantasy literature. That's my quotation down there that I put in. You know, up here he's saying alternate states of consciousness are bad things. Page 20, alternate states are wonderful things. And, you know, I don't, I'm not been keeping up with things, but the guy's probably coming out and, and selling more books to promote the new Lord of the Rings stuff. Down here it says, People of all faiths have enjoyed the adventures of Frodo, Sam, Gandalf, and others. Sure. Well, if it was Bible-based, wouldn't it be uh, leading people to the Lord? The Lord Jesus Christ? Okay, up here it says... For the Christian, this can only can mean only one thing. Fantasy is a place where we can come face to face with Christ. Okay, this is the Finding God in the Lord of the Rings book. Number four here, Gospel according to Tolkien. It says, Lord of the Rings, according to three different polls, British readers just declared it to be the most important book of the 20th century. Not the Bible, but the Lord of the Rings. Tolkien honors, for example, the deep fatalism that characterizes pagan life, pagan life, whether it be the contemporary paganism of the late modern West or far, the far nobler, nobler kind that prevailed in ancient Germany and Scandinavia, as well as antique Greece and Rome. So, yeah. Here we go again. Genesis records God as speaking the cosmos into being, and the fourth evangelist declared God to be the Logos who stands at the beginning of things, even as he declares Jesus Christ to be the Logos who has become flesh. Christians are, by definition, Logocentrists. We believe that the incarnate Logos is the center of the cosmos. Okay. Uh, wrong. <laughs> that guy's nuts. Uh, here we go again. Page 41. Saruman the White begins as a righteous wizard for whom Gandalf has the utmost regard. So you can begin as a righteous wizard. What is a righteous wizard, you know? I mean, it's like saying a sanctified stripper. You know? Sure. Continuing here, he says, We confess instead Christ's descent into hell while admitting that it is too, that it too is a created realm, not an eternal reality. Ralph Wood, the Gospel according to Tolkien, does not believe in the reality of hell. It's not eternal. It's created, it's a created realm, but it's not eternal. You don't have to worry about going to hell forever and ever and ever. I mean, when Jesus said about plucking out your eye and cutting off your hand rather than going to hell, he was just fooling around. That was just fun. Poetic, you know? Sure. Okay, here we go again. Many of my students have confessed that they feel clean after reading The Lord of the Rings. How disgusting. Um, okay, number five, this uh, Walking with Frodo devotional book. She talks about, we sh sure we know the mantra, New Age occult term. Number six, the fiction of Tolkien. It says, speaking about Gandalf, his own reincarnation, he interprets as one more move in the plan. So Tolkien's reincarnated. Or uh, not Tolkien, excuse me, Gandalf. Which Tolkien says, you know, I don't really see any reason to not believe in reincarnation. Okay, continuing here, it says, Tolkien is careful never to say anything explicit about the nothingness to which they go. Doubly careful never to call it hell, but it shares with hell the distinguishing feature of total estrangement from ultimate being. Well, sorry there, but it was purgatory that Tolkien was saying about some of these creatures going to. Tolkien's sense of the aliveness of the 
Whoop, let me show you here. Tolkien's sense of the aliveness of this uh, poplar and consequently of the cruelty done to it is so strong as to arouse in him the indignation one might feel at the murder of a man. In other words, Tolkien was somewhat of a tree hugger. He didn't like trees being cut down. I guess he wouldn't like me too much being a logger. Former logger. Wouldn't like my channel name being named after a chainsaw. But uh, down here it says, Through the use of the palantir, Aragorn grows to maturity. Uh-huh. One of these is Tolkien's belief that a sub-creator of tales be, besides glimpsing existing reality is allowed by God's grace to contribute to the ongoing process of divine creation. So the Bible isn't what you need, you know, standard in all matters of faith and practice. No, no. We keep creating. Keep creating truth. New truths that contradict and overthrow the Bible. You know? Okay, here's talking about, uh, from the 1967 story, Smith of Wooten Major. Tolkien wrote other books too, by the way. I haven't read every single little, single little thing that he ever wrote. I read the main things about his Middle Earth uh, stuff. But he wrote this Wooten, Smith of Wooten Major. Look what it says here. Smith with his star glowing brightly on his forehead. Hmm. So Tolkien is writing a book about a man that has a star upon his forehead. Hmm. Revelation chapter 13. Here we have tears from the star. Tears tears the star from his brow. Okay. Thing there happens. Smith can be a practitioner of the white art. White witchcraft. White magic. He wants to summon up once more one of the master images of all, of all his work, the Tree of Tales, which is the symbol of fairy. In other words, a Yggdrasil that I showed earlier there from the Nordic myths. His shining shield was scored with runes to ward all wounds and harm from him. Here he talks about astrology and divination down in here. This is back to Richard of Baines, his book on the uh, Harry Potter thing. It says, uh, it is a natural ability given only to elves. No other race, including orcs, trolls, dwarves, hobbits, and others, has magical capabilities. Uh-huh. So it must be good then, right? Down here, beyond a limited number of vague similarities, Tolkien's work, works and those of J.K. Rowling are vastly different. No, they're not. All right. Quotes concerning C.S. Lewis. says here, Lewis, who would become the greatest Christian apologist of the 20th century, Lewis had his eccentricities. He drank frequently and heavily and smoked up to 60 cigarettes a day in, in addition to smoking a pipe regularly. 60 cigarettes a day? And he's the greatest Christian apologist of the 20th century? And heavily drinking and smoking a pipe too? Here you have, this is the Sanctifying Myth book. The story of Christ is simply a true myth. We talked about that earlier. Um, a man who disbelieved the Christian story as fact but continually fed on its myth would perhaps, Lewis explained, be more spiritually alive than one who assented and did not think much about it. So in other words, if you have faith, if you just believe by faith, you're not really much of anything. You just say, oh, I believe the Christian myth and I think it's just a myth. Then you're really spiritual like Tolkien. You know, Sure. Okay, down here, the same book, page 100. First, the story of Numenor represents Tolkien incorporation of the Atlantis myth into his own legendarium. Tolkien believed that Atlantis, or a version of it, was fundamental to mythical history, whether it contained a basis in reality or not. Lewis must have agreed with Tolkien, as he referred to Tolkien's version of Numenor several times in his famous space trilogy, and also alludes to it in the Chronicles of Narnia. These guys work together. Here we have, in the Chronicles of Narnia series, for instance, devout Christian C.S. Lewis positively speaks of a stargazer, which in our world normally re would refer to an astrologer. Such a reference completely contradicts Lewis's faith. Noteworthy, however, is the fact that Lewis's stargazer is not in our world. Oh, then it must be good. 
up here it says, speaking of, uh, this would be, let's see, one, two, three, four. C.S. Lewis and the Catholic Church. Okay? It says here, he spoke of the Blessed Virgin and made his confession to his priest regularly and believed in purgatory and even came to refer to the Eucharist as Heaven help us all the Mass. So he believed in the Mass. Here it says, in a development that has puzzled some of his Protestant champions to no end, Lewis has been credited or blamed in recent years with setting numerous people on the road to Rome. Yep. Two traditionally Catholic theological subjects as treated in the pages of Lewis, these two subjects are purgatory and the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, both, both of which Lewis seems to have understood remarkably well and to have believed in strongly. Down here, it's talking about C.S. Lewis. Speaking of C.S. Lewis, it says there he wrote two letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer, published posthumously, in other words, after he died in 1963. He says, our souls demand purgatory, don't they? And you think C.S. Lewis was a Christian. Wrong. Down here it says, discussing a letter, letter C.S. Lewis wrote where he condemned Puritans, it is interesting to note Lewis's criticism in this letter of what might be termed bibliolatry, the superstitious and idolatrous worship of the Bible, which results from its being read without due deference and reference to theological tradition. So uh, I guess I'm a uh, bibliolater. Bible thumper. Narrow-minded bigot. Yeah, heard it before. Down here he says, Religious faith he wrote in a letter to a friend in 1921 was unsuitable for us who are alive now. We know too much and see life too widely, and it is culpable not to make use of our wide, widened landscape. Uh, theirs was not the comfortable little universe with heaven above and hell beneath, an absolute up and down, and a basic, a bare 6,000 years of recorded history. That's what, told, or that's what C.S. Lewis thought about Christians and thought about the Bible. It's not enough. You know, we're so much smarter than that now. We don't believe, you know, in heaven above and hell beneath and only 6,000 years of recorded history. Ha, ha, ha. Ah, C.S. Lewis isn't laughing now, is he? It says here, according to Walter Hooper, Lewis's friend and biographer, a realization of the truth in mythologies triggered Lewis's conversion to Christianity. So it wasn't him coming to God as a sinner. It wasn't him coming in a broken, contrite spirit saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That wasn't it. It was him saying, you mean I can believe in pagan myths and, and fairy tales and things like this? Oh, wow, okay. And I can be a Christian and be a pagan. A pagan Christian. Oh, oh I think I'm going to be converted. Sure. Here he says, or here it says, Lewis explained that he felt the power of myths, but that they were ultimately uh, untrue. As he expressed it to Tolkien, myths were lies even though lies breathe through silver. No, Tolkien replied as emphatically, they are not. Tolkien resumed arguing that myths, far from being, being lies, were the best way of conveying truths, which would otherwise be inexpressible. Yeah, because Tolkien was a pagan himself. Down here it says, it was Hooker, perhaps more than any other Anglican theologian, who argued against the Puritan position of his day and the Protestant fundamentalist and evangelical position of today that Scripture is the sole guide of human conduct. Against this creed of sola scriptura, or what might be termed bibliolatry, Hooker maintained in his magnum opus laws of ecclesiastical polity that the sacraments were central to Christian worship and that sacred tradition, sanctioned by the authority of the church, was an inter integral part of the deposit of faith. Certainly there is no escaping the fact, thought, though Lewis sometimes endeavored to do so, that in selecting Hooker as the theologian to whom he owed the greatest debt, Lewis was hanging his coat of allegiance within the Church of England firmly on the high hook of Anglo-Catholicism. What are you doing with C.S. Lewis books in your home? I suggest you burn them. Chapter 5, page 71. According to Tolkien, Lewis had taken a fair, fair deal of port and was a little belligerent. We read that earlier. Let me just see how much more I have here. I think I'm getting pretty close to being done. Yep, just a few more pages to go.
here we have the same book. It says here, this woman has got to be in some ways like a pagan goddess and in other ways like the Blessed Virgin, you know, Sister Penelope. Uh, he's what Tolkien wrote to in his book, Paralendra. She's a pagan goddess, but like the Blessed Virgin. Yeah. Down here he says, did you hear, did you never hear of the refrigerium? It means that damned, that the damned have holidays excursions, you understand. C.S. Lewis was, you know, quoting C.S. Lewis's great divorce. He basically says about this, this warped, you know, philosophy of this thing called a refrigerium, where basically the people in hell get to go to heaven for a little bit before they have to go back to hell again. They get like a little bit of time off or something. Nonsense. Here it says, uh, referring to Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, the souls who might have appeared to have been in hell discover, once they repent, that they were actually in purgatory all the time. Only the stubbornly impenitent are truly and actually in hell. They cannot escape hell because they do not want to. They return to hell of their own free will and by their own volition. Hell is their true home. Though they despise it, it is where they belong. Huh? See the warped philosophy of C.S. Lewis, and this guy's the greatest Christian apologist, uh, or you know, greatest Christian theologian of the 20th century. I don't think so. Here we go again. There are three things that spread the Christ life to us. Lewis asserts baptism, belief, and the mysterious action which different Christians call by different names: Holy Communion, the Mass, or the Lord's Supper. Lewis ex is excluding the Protestant doctrine of sola fide from the merely Christian. I wasn't saved. Down here it says, the yellow quote here, quoting from Mere Christianity, Lewis concludes that this explains why this new life is spread not only by purely mental acts like belief, but by bodily acts like baptism and holy communion. God never meant man to be a purely spiritual creature. That is why he uses material things like bread and wine to put the new life into us. He was a Catholic. All to that's all C.S. Lewis was. The man was a Catholic. Tolkien was a Catholic. C.S. Lewis was a, Cath was a Catholic. Continuing here, it says, same book, it says, and of course, in stating in mere Christianity that a church-going self-righteous prig might be nearer to hell than a prostitute. One wonders, in fact, whether Lewis recalled his words about self-righteous prigs a few years later following his being banned from the Protestant Hour Network on American radio for his startling frankness on sexual love. Take, for instance, the allusion to purgatory in Lewis's, Lewis's mention of the purification after death or his references to the Blessed Sacrament as the holiest object presented to your senses. Nice. Down here we read, sent, She sent him a photograph of the turn shroud, and thereafter he kept it on the wall of his bedroom for the rest of his life, venerating the relic as any good Catholic might have done. But he was a Christian. No, he was not. Lewis's reiteration of his belief in purgatory, of course I pray for the dead, he, sa he states he hardly knew how the rest of his prayers would survive if, quote, those for the dead were forbidden. Down here, when you die, and if... Prison visiting, visiting is allowed. Come down and look me up in purgatory. He writes to a Catholic nun, Sister Penelope. Prison visiting, you know, if, if you can come down and visit me in purgatory, you know, come on down. Well, she's down there with him now, probably in hell, burning, and they're realizing it's not purgatory, and they aren't getting out. Okay, down here. Without going into much detail, suffice it to say that Lewis was an occultist. He was a theosophist before he turned to the Anglican Church, but he took his occultic ideas with him. That's from Dr. Kathy Burns' book. Here again, we read in Kathy Burns' book. Um, Some people seem to think that I begin by asking myself how I could say something about Christianity to children, then fixed on the fairy tale as an instrument then collected information about child psychology and decided what age group I'd write for, then drew up a list of basic Christian truths and hammered out allegories to embody them. This is all pure moonshine. This is what C.S. Lewis is saying here. I couldn't write in that way at all. Everything began with images, a fawn carrying an umbrella, a queen on, the, on a sledge, a magnificent lion. At first, there wasn't even anything Christian about them. That element pushed itself in of its own accord. I don't think so. So again... 
Tolkien is saying, no, there's nothing Christian in here. And then later he says, well, yeah, maybe, you know, kind of. C.S. Lewis is saying the same thing. You say, but I, you know, I think it's good to read these to our children and stuff so that they have a healthy alternate reality and fantasy and things like this. You read this kind of pagan satanic junk to your children, it's going to mess them up. Okay, it says here, Kathy Burns' book again, Billy Graham and His Friends, it says, Interestingly, occult stores carry the Chronicles of Narnia and other books by Lewis. A New Age publisher actually named their company Aslan Publishing. That's nice. Down here, Dr. Shirley, Shirley Carell shares this important tidbit. It would be difficult to go to any occult bookstore and not find the Chronicles of Narnia promoted. One such occult bookstore owner told this author and others that he became involved in the occult as a result of reading the Chronicles of Narnia. I believe that totally. The books were discovered by students of metaf or mystical metaphysics because they truly convey an inspirational feeling of sacred dimensions parallel to the physical plane. Enter Narnia and you experience magic lands, magical lands and enchanted happenings. So kids that are into the occult mess around with Satanism and stuff, they love the books. Moreover, Lewis believed the Bible to be flawed, denied the depravity of man, the inerrancy of Scripture, and the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. And he's a Christian apologist? No, he isn't. He suggested that Jesus was an ignorant prophet, regret, regret, bleh, regrettably tied to the Jewish messianic myth. Lewis further suggested that Jesus' prophecies had failed to come to pass. Lewis wrote, I have the deepest respect for pagan myths, still more for the myths in the Holy Scriptures. Insane. Down here we read, in mere Christianity, Lewis wrote that God said in the Bible that we were gods, lowercase g, and he is going to make good his words if we let, if we let him. If we can prevent him, if we choose, he will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a god or gods, goddess. Dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. C.S. Lewis. Yeah. And again, quotes which are attacks on real Bible-believing Christians. The sanctifying myth here of Tolkien, it says, The Christian fundamentalists have rejected the importance of myth. Amen. Praise the Lord. Absolutely right. Here they say, for religious fundamentalists, myths also represent lies. Myths, the argument runs, constitute dangerous rivals to the Christian truth. No, it's not a dangerous rival, it's just a pagan lie. And it may lead the unwary astray even into the very grip of hell. And they do. Why study the Volsunga or Homer, for example, when the Christian gospel tells us all we need for salvation? It is likely the fundamentalist concludes that all myth comes from the devil and it is an attempt to distract us from the truth of Christ. The ancient gods and demigods of Greece, Rome, and Northern Europe, after all, must have been nothing more than demons in disguise. <laughs> That's exactly true. Yeah. The Protestant fascination with the early primitive Christian church, Tolkien wrote, simply resulted in a morbid fascination with ignorance. That's your boy there. Go to the Christian bookstore and buy this Satanic Losers books. Morbid fascination with ignorance if you're trying to do things the Bible way. Down here it says, Tolkien sanctifying myth still, it says Tolkien's own dislike of Protestantism, Protestantism surfaced frequently. Of course it did. He was a radical Catholic. He labeled the Reformation the Western European Revolt in which Little more than an evil attack on the sanctity of the Blessed Sacrament with faith works a mere red herring. In other words, he was like, oh, the, the Reformation attacked the Blessed Sacrament. Oh, yeah. Terrible. This book does not advocate book burning, book banning, uh, or rigid censorship. Let me say that again. I am not in any way advocating book burning, book banning, or rigid censorship. Again, which one? Faith, fantasy, and your family. Excuse me, not faith. Yeah, he wouldn't write that. Richard of Baines. Well, sorry there, buddy, because I'm going to burn your book when I'm done with this study. And I'm going to enjoy burning it. Okay. Uh, let's see down here. 
when closely examined, the concerns most often expressed by Christians regarding the Lord of the Rings are without merit. Their objections commonly rest on several misunderstandings of the text. For example, as previously stated, Tolkien's wizards are not the kind of wizards condemned in the Bible. They are, for all intents and purposes, angels. Okay, sure. <laughs> Insane. And I like to remind their old abanes there that there are fallen angels, you know? Surprisingly, despite such learned opinions, the Lord of the Rings continues to be interpreted by some individuals as a kind of promotional volume for occultism. That's exactly what it is. This may be due in part to their unfamiliarity with the work. I read them all. I read the letters of Tolkien, the biography of Tolkien, the Silmarillion. I've seen all the movies. I've seen all the movies with the special interviews with the actors and all the other stuff. I've seen it all. I understand the occult. I understand Satanism. And I can tell you this whole, all this stuff here, satanic. And it's going to burn. So it's not an unfamiliarity with the work. I don't think so. Down here it says, religious extremism and narrow-minded bigotry. The worst examples of misguided zealotry. Example given, book burning. Well, I'm going to just prove that is absolutely true by burning your books there, Richard Abaines. And I'm going to enjoy doing it. Ignorant Bible thumpers. This guy's a Christian, mind you. You go into a Christian bookstore, you know, Dove, Joy, any of these other satanic places, you go in there, you buy this book from a Christian author, you know, and he's talking about ignorant Bible thumpers and saying, there's nothing wrong with occultism. The There's nothing wrong with that stuff. It's, it's good to have fantasy. If your children aren't being involved in fantasy, they're deprived. Right there. A witch, a Satanist entering into professing Christianity and, and claiming to be a Christian. That's what that book is. He says here, ignorant Bible thumpers, numerous articles have even resorted to mocking Christians as narrow-minded moralists. Oh, horrors. Oh, terrible. You know? <laughs> okay, it says here, To be fair, concern over book burning is legitimate. It can lead to all manner of unnecessary censorship if book burners attempt to impose by force their values on others. Oh, you, we should never do that. You should never witness for Jesus Christ. You should never tell people that they're going to hell. Here he says, there may indeed be some individuals who call themselves Christians and exhibit a lack of sophistication about certain issues. However, labeling all Christians as narrow-minded bigots seems more of an attack against the Christian religion than against any arguments than any arguments than against any arguments against Harry Potter. Right. Okay. Then you go into the thing here, Tolkien's uh, smoking and drinking habits. I think I already talked about that. Okay, and I think I'm just going to skip over some of this stuff. Ah, there's just a couple more quotes. I'll finish up here because I'm just going to do this and get this study done. Um, claim, quotes are claimed Tolkien's book are, books are historical, not merely fiction. Lewis G. Hale in the Saturday Review treated the Fellowship of the Rings as a serious history of a real time in a real place. Yeah, because they're half nuts. The book is all about the world that God created, the actual world of this planet. You know, that's what Tolkien said. Okay, Tolkien believed that he had not devised his magnificent mythical world so much as he had found it indeed, uh, that it had been revealed to him by God. All, always I had the sense, he declared, of recording what was already there, something somewhere not of inventing. The tales arose in his mind, he confessed, as given things, and as they came separately, so too the links grew. Tolkien thus came to regard his characters and their realm not as a fictional, but as historical persons and places. Venice, he confessed, was like a dream of old Gondor. Okay, here it says, Tolkien has not yet learned to take the pains he later takes to make us accept this world as our own planet and the events of his story as a portion of Earth's distant prehistory. Sure. People get so desperate to, to sanctify and to bring in paganism and all this other stuff that they, they resort to fiction, works of fiction, and say, actually, it's really, truly history. Well, here we have his biography. 
page 111. One easily understands Michael Tolkien's remark that is that from his father he inherited an almost obsessive love of trees and considered the massive felling of trees the wanton murder of living beings for very shoddy ends. You know, yeah, I agree with that. You shouldn't cut down trees to print this kind of crap. All right. And that's going to be it for my notes that I took. And, you know, there's so many things in here we could go over. And I'm not going to go over all this stuff just because, you know, what's the point? I mean, if you've seen these quotes, if you've seen all this stuff and you're not convinced and you say, well, you know, I, I still think that Lord of the Rings is a good Christian thing. And I think I can read it to my children. I think it's a wonderful thing. I, I'm just, I, I think it's good, Brian. I don't think that you've proved your point. Well, I can't help you. I really can't help you. You're beyond help. All right. This stuff is occultism. And by the way, you say, um, well, Brian, could you please explain to me what do you believe the story was actually about? I believe that Tolkien, Mr. Catholic right here, I believe that Tolkien was envisioning the restoration of the Roman Catholic Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, with the return of the king, the Antichrist, coming, setting up his throne in the Vatican and also in Jerusalem, there. And you say, well, what was the ring? This ring that corrupted people, this, this evil ring and everything. You know what I think it is? After studying this thing and looking at it from all the different angles, you know what I think it is? This book right here. You say, oh, come on, Brian. He's a Christian. He's a Catholic. He, would have, he wouldn't have attacked. Say the Bible corrupts people? Yeah. I've tried to think of what it was. You know, some people say, well, maybe it was science or, or technology or something like this. This was the thing that corrupts people. I think he was symbolizing the Bible. I really do. And the horrible orc race and the Lord... Sauron and all this stuff that, that had this made this ring and the power that he had and everything, I think is a reference to the Jews and God. Because they were the ones that were going out and killing these pagan people in the past. Ruin all their fun, you know, that they had. Worshipping in the groves and the high places and everything else. Mm -hmm. I think that's what the books were about. A pagan satanic system that is getting humanity ready. And, and what has Hollywood been doing for the last hundred years? They make movie after movie after movie after movie about the little guy rising up and being loved and appreciated and wonderful and great and everything else. And a hero coming onto the scene, a great warrior. They've been picturing the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. That's what this is about. And, of course, you know, I understand that the, the Peter Jackson type of thing, I mean, that stuff in here, you know, I was looking at, you know, they're making like tens of millions of dollars, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on these films and stuff. I mean, just money, 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 rolling in and stuff. And the family, the Tolkien family at one point's fighting the, you know, Peter Jackson because they're not getting their proper amount and all this other stuff. And the love of money is the root of all evil. C.S. Lewis and, and Tolkien and the guy... They wouldn't have printed their books if it wasn't about money, you know. And Peter Jackson wouldn't have made these stupid movies over in here. He wouldn't have made these movies if there wasn't millions of dollars in it. And that's what the new movie coming out in December is going to be. It's just another bringing out more witchcraft, more Satanism to get the masses to accept it, to get the masses to love it. So God's wrath has to come upon this country. That's what this thing is. That's all it is. Now, as I stated... I'm done with this study. I've been wanting to do this thing for a long time. It's finally finished. I know probably a lot of people are going, man, you've been talking about this thing for years. Yeah, I have. Just a lot of other studies come up and things, and I get busy, you know. But I want to get this thing done, because quite frankly, I don't want this junk in my house anymore. So I'm going to take this stuff out and burn it. Maybe I'll post a video of it, you know, in the future, me destroying all this garbage here. I'm going to burn it. And let me tell you something. If you have Tolkien's Lord of the Rings or C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, you need to get rid of them. And I don't mean take them down to the local Goodwill and donate them. 
I don't mean putting them on eBay and selling them. Burn it. Burn it. That's what you do. In the book of Acts, it talks about that. Burning. They brought all their curious arts and their occult types of things together and they burned them. That's what you have to do. Well, but won't we be a narrow-minded bigot? Well, the world's going to call you that whether you do right or wrong. So that is going to be it for this study. I do hope that the Lord convicts you of this thing. If you have this junk in your home, get rid of it. I'm sick and tired of the spiritual uh, atmosphere that is around these books. I've been hanging on to these things for far too long, so study is going to be over here, and I'm going to go burn them. So that's enough talking. I'm going to keep rambling. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and uh, I just pray that if you have these things, that you take heed to what I'm saying here. All right. And uh, I didn't even I didn't even get into the actual, you know, books and things, and and what goes on in these books, the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the Hobbit here. There's witchcraft and magic all through these things, spell casting and, and all kinds of stuff. It's just wizardry and witchcraft under a Christian pretense. And it's not Christian. That is it. Thank you very much for watching.